Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Ko. I'm an internist with UCLA Health, and thank you for joining me this afternoon. Uh, my present presentation today is titled Yoga as Medicine. So I want to remind you that you can ask uh, questions on Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat, and we'll be um, answering questions at the end. So I first discovered yoga in college. My mom had a private instructor who came to her house and um, gave lessons to a group of ladies. I was interested, tagged along, and finally developed my own practice when I was in medical school, where as you can, under, as you can um, imagine, the chaos of the studies and the mental, the physical, the emotional um, uh, toils uh, really required me to find an outlet elsewhere. So I continued my practice through residency, and um, during residency, I decided to um, take my practice to a deeper level. That's when I signed up for yoga teacher training. So I completed a 200-hour intensive class um, at Kripalu, which is in Lenox, Massachusetts, um, and came back with this enthusiasm to bring yoga to all of my patients, the ones who were suffering from low back pain, hip pain, knee pain, shoulder pain, fibromyalgia, um, depression, anxiety, insomnia, all these conditions for which modern medicine doesn't have a lot of great answers for. And my hope is that I can introduce yoga to you. Um, I know I'm speaking to a diverse population, to seasoned yoginis and to amateurs, and I hope that um, with this presentation, you can also incorporate yoga into your own life. So this data comes from the National Health Interview Survey. This is an annual survey conducted by the um, CDC, and it's um, the best information that we have for um, the American health. So it's 40,000 individuals who are surveyed. Every five years, there is a complementary health um, approach um, special section. So we know that a third of individuals use complementary health practices. Um, the majority of these patients use dietary supplements, um, multivitamins, um, but we also know that almost one of 10 adults practice yoga. This number has been rising in recent years, and we also know that yoga has been more popular among children as well. <clears throat> and you can see from this chart too that green is yoga, and we started collecting data in 2002 where 5% of the adults in the United States practice yoga, and the number has slowly risen from five to six to most recently 9.5%. Looking at the other healing modalities, massage therapy, also very popular, has remained stable, whereas acupuncture, guided imagery, progressive relaxation, also popular modalities, have kind of stayed stable. But the important point in this slide is just seeing the drastic rise in the green curve all the way up to 9.5% of the general adult population in the United States practicing yoga. So the question is why? And these are reports from the same 40,000 individuals of all of the benefits that they've reported with their yoga practice. So over 60% of patients uh, were motivated to exercise more regularly. 40% of yoga users to eat healthier, improvements in sleep, reduced stress, and cutting out bad habits too, both alcohol and cigarette use. So overall, lots of benefits physically, emotionally, and um, through, through toxic habits as well too. So lots of great benefits to, um, to yoga practice. So when people in the West um, hear of yoga, we usually refer to the practice of postures, um, also called asanas. And um, this misconception is, is is expected because asanas make for the most interesting pictures in magazines and in websites as well too. So one message I hope to come across today is that yoga is beyond the posture. There's so much more to it than just the physical postures or the asana practice. So misconceptions. Yoga is only for the flexible and fit. And similarly, yoga is only for those in good health. So the students who just begin yoga, they're actually the ones who have the most to gain. 
and those who find yoga the most challenging actually reap the most benefits. Yoga is a religion. So yoga is derived from ancient India. There definitely is a spiritual side to the practice, but it by no means is a religion. Yoga is happily practiced by individuals of all religions. And what I love is the take it or leave it approach in the sense that if chanting seems foreign to you, don't do it. If, um, if a meditation uh, is foreign, then you can definitely skip out. So there definitely is a, a take it as you wish. You um, can reap whatever benefits you wish without subscribing to any particular beliefs. And finally, yoga is for women. Yoga is happily practiced by men, women, children of all ages. So the word yoga is derived from the Sanskrit root yuj, which means to join or to unite. Um, this is the union of body and spirit and breath. So as I mentioned, yoga is um, originated from ancient India, and as a practice, it integrates physical postures, the asanas, breathing techniques, and also meditation. So philosophically, yoga is a system that's aimed to achieve mastery of the mind through physical postures and in the process cultivate just a sense of relaxation and calm. Um, yoga was first introduced to the United States in the 1890s when Swami Vivekananda, who was a Hindu monk, he gave an address at the World's Fair in Chicago and yoga subsequently found a second boom in the 1980s when Dean Ornish connected yoga to heart health. <clears throat> so why practice yoga? So yoga is a low impact physical exercise. It's mindfulness in motion and mindfulness refers to the act of being in the present moment, remaining attentive to the now in a non-judgmental manner. And yoga can be seen as a practice of mindfulness in motion. And through the practice, we can strengthen the body, can calm the mind, and also in the process, cultivate relaxation. Dr. Herbert Benson, who was the father of mindfulness, um, described the relaxation response. So the sympathetic nervous system is responsible for the fight or the flight. It's the activating part of the nervous system whereas the parasympathetic nervous system is the calming part. And we know that not only yoga, but also other um, my, uh, mind-body techniques like meditation, mindfulness, tai chi, um, can definitely strengthen and calm the parasympathetic nervous system. So this fosters a sense of equanimity, of calm, of peace. And I love this quote, whether you are sick or weak, young, old, or even very old, you can succeed in yoga if you practice diligently. So here are some of the benefits of yoga. The left column uh, signifying the emotional benefits, and then the right column uh, listing the physical benefits. So the emotional benefits of yoga reduce stress, and that's huge for our community where we have a lot of stress and anxiety surrounding work and family and friends. Yoga is absolutely a wonderful modality to help reduce stress. In the process, it can lift the mood, foster psychological equanimity, and in the process, promote spiritual well-being as well. The list of physical benefits is long. Flexibility, cardiovascular, um, improve balance, prevent falls, um, promote strength, um, lower blood pressure, and, uh, and achieve weight loss as well too. These are all benefits of yoga. I don't know of many other forms of physical activity that has such a comprehensive list of benefits. <clears throat> I want to focus on this chart which compares conventional medicine, Western medicine, allopathic medicine, compared to the idea of yoga as medicine. So I am by all means a subscriber of conventional medicine um, and practice it wholeheartedly and um, want you to understand that yoga as medicine and conventional medicine can exist together and it's not one or the other. Um, so as conventional medicine, sometimes we have a reductionist approach towards medical problems. You know, what's the problem today that you're experiencing? We have such a diverse network of subspecialists 
cardiologist, lung specialist, orthopedics that tend to just one organ. Whereas as yoga is medicine, it's much more of a holistic approach, a whole body approach towards healing. With conventional medicine, effects sometimes wane over time. Medications, treatments, um, they lose their efficacy over time. Whereas with yoga as medicine, the effects are cumulative. They increase as you practice more and more, more diligently. Conventional medicine is great for acute problems, for infections, for surgery. Um, whereas yoga is medicine, much better for the chronic issues, for um, chronic pain, for mental illnesses. In conventional medicine, the patient can sometimes be the passant recipient to therapy. You're told what to do. You're given a prescription. Um, whereas in yoga as medicine, the patient is actively engaged. They are, the, they are their healer. Conventional medicine relies a lot on high tech, on advanced imaging and procedures. Whereas yoga as medicine, it's very low tech. Similarly, a lot of the treatment in conventional medicine takes place in the hospital or in the clinic whereas um, yoga treatment at home. Conventional medicine very much relies on scientific evidence, evidence-based medicine, trials, clinical studies, whereas yoga is medicine, we rely very much on the direct experience of the patient. How are you feeling? How are you advancing? What needs do you have? We revive, rely very much on diagnostic tests to help us understand what's going on, blood work, imaging, whereas um, with the yoga as medicine approach, it's about the direct observation of the patient, what's wrong. And in conventional medicine, we tend to think of the absence of symptoms as equating to health. So I feel well, I don't have any symptoms, I must be healthy. Whereas the yoga as medicine approach focuses more on health in the broader definition. So optimizing the function of every organ system, mind, body, soul, and, and therefore promotion, promoting emotional well-being. So again, I don't want you to think of conventional medicine and yoga as competing forces. They can exist together happily, and it's ways to incorporate both and to pull from um, both healing systems um, to promote optimal health. So the principle of ahimsa or nonviolence is the foundation of yoga. So just like when we took the Hippocratic Oath when we graduated from medical school, first do no harm, first do no harm to your patients is the tenant that we abide by throughout our daily practice. Similarly, the principle of ahimsa or nonviolence should always be honored. What does this mean? It means to respect your body's limits, to listen to its wisdom. If something hurts, don't do it. If a posture is uncomfortable, come out of it. So ahimsa is the foundation of both medicine and yoga as well. <clears throat> the eight limbs is um, also called Ashtanga. Patanjali wrote the Yoga Sutras. It's the ancient text of yoga practice. And um, he describes the eight limbs of yoga. So the yamas and the niyamas are the restraints of the observances. The asanas, which are the postures, which we commonly think of in Western uh, the world as the foundation of yoga only constitutes one of the eight limbs. So one of the points that I want you to get from um, this presentation is yoga extends beyond the postures. Yoga takes into account lifestyle, breathing, meditation. There are so many other components. It is a philosophy, a lifestyle, a lifelong journey, and the asanas are just one means to achieve the full yoga practice. So yoga as medicine, I've listed a couple of conditions for which yoga has demonstrated efficacy. A lot of the research for yoga as medicine comes um, from India, and unfortunately the, uh, the research isn't as accessible, and unfortunately the translation also plays a role in, um, in the lack of information. So there has been a lot of uh, of research in the United States now exploring yoga for these conditions that I've listed, with back pain being probably the most uh, well-documented means of, um, of yoga. Depression and anxiety, mental health illness, illness very prevalent in our community, um, also with efficacy with yoga. 
yoga tends to calm the mind with reliance on the breath, and that cultivates a sense of equanimity that, um, that, that is difficult to achieve even through medications. Insomnia, lots of patients struggle with um, difficulty falling asleep. We have kind of an endless parade of thoughts, um, just endless verbal stream of to-do list of worries, and um, getting to sleep can be difficult. So um, yoga has been, um, has been shown to help with insomnia, not only with the postures, but also with the breath work, and also with the meditation as well too. Fibromyalgia is a debilitating disease for a lot of patients, chronic pain, and uh, fibromyalgia has been demonstrated um, to, to respond well to yoga therapy. Um, it allows patients to establish a connection between their bodies and their mind to process pain in a different way and to engage themselves in all the aches and pains that they experience. Menopause, lots of women experience menopause and a lot of uncontrolled symptoms, hot flashes, um, irritability, and lots of great studies with yoga um, having efficacy with menopausal symptoms. I haven't included all of the um, citations here. Um, I do have them for anyone who is interested in, in learning about all of the studies and their associated conditions. I do wanna share with you the clinical guidelines um, to the diagnosis and treatment of low back pain. This is a joint publication by the American College of Physicians and the American Pain Society and was a low back pain guidelines panel. And low back pain is so commonly seen in the primary care setting and we know that there's a lot of ways to, um, to treat physical therapy, anti-inflammatory medicines. And I want to show you that yoga right here is listed too as a, um, as a healing modality for low back pain. And this is based on a couple of robust studies that were published in the American College of Physicians Journal, the Annals of Internal Medicine. So for those of you who have low back pain, absolutely encourage you to incorporate yoga into your practice and you will see results. So there absolutely is a growing interest in yoga and its applications um, to health. It comes from you, the general public, and we know that one in 10 of adults practice yoga, and I anticipate that number to continue to rise. Many, of pe many people find yoga's ability to prevent, relieve, and heal chronic conditions a welcome complement to the offerings of modern medicine. So again, it's not um, a duality of choosing one or the other, but incorporating some mind-body techniques like yoga with the advances of modern medicine to find a state of health. And finally, this quote from BKS Iyengar, words fail to convey the total value of yoga. It has to be experienced. So what I have found from my yoga practice is just a sense of gratitude, a sense of community to other teachers and to students, and to the opening of some formerly inflexible parts of my body and mind. And what I hope that you will um, receive from this uh, presentation is that yoga is um, beyond the postures. It's about incorporating meditation, mindfulness, breath work to achieve a sense of peace. So I encourage you to ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat. So can doctors recommend yoga as therapy? Is it covered by insurance? So unfortunately, yoga is not covered by insurance. Uh, physical therapy in a physical therapy office is covered, um, but yoga in and of itself um, is not covered. So then comes the question of there's so many different styles of yoga, so many different schools, different teachers. How do I find the right uh, teacher and class for me? Um, there are a number of different styles of yoga, vinyasa, hatha, ashtanga, um, ayangar, and they're all different schools of thought based on yogis who have um, pioneered a certain uh, technique. Um, what I will say is that it's not so much the actual style that you should be concerned about, but more so the quality of the teacher. So, if you belong to a gym or to a YMCA, I encourage you to check out some classes 
um, through your group group uh, sessions. Um, if you have the means of going to yoga studios, I know classes can be expensive, um, but in the end, it's a cumulative benefit, and the cost will outweigh the eventual problems, the cost that can accumulate. Um, you may not love your first teacher or your second teacher or your third teacher, and I encourage you to keep on looking, and hopefully you will find the one. Um, it takes a while to find someone with the right attitude and the style and the teaching style um, that complements your own. Um, and there are more and more centers now that are also offering chair yoga classes. Um, if you have difficulty going from seated to standing from lying down, then chair yoga can be a great introductory course. Um, as you're seated in the chair, it's a, a more of a low impact introductory course. <clears throat> All right. Can you demonstrate some postures for low back pain? Okay. <clears throat> Um, so a simple posture that I love is just standing forward fold. And that's a matter of just standing with your feet parallel, hips distance apart, and then just bending at the hip joint with the straight back and just allowing your head to hang loose. You can grasp opposite elbows or you can touch your toes, gently rest your hands on your feet or on your on your shins, but it's allowing the weight of your head to just draw you closer to the earth. And this is a great posture because it elongates the spine. It's, it's a spinal flexion elongating the space in between the spine, and it's a great hamstring stretch as well. A lot of patients with low back pain actually have tight hamstrings, so one of the focuses of strengthening the back is by focusing on the hamstrings. So again, standing forward fold, just allowing the head to hang, grasping opposite elbows, a focus on the breath. If this places a lot of tension on your low back, you can put a gentle bend in your knee, and this helps take out some of the tension in the low back. It's called Uttanasana. <clears throat> Another posture that I love for low back pain is, um, it's called kind of the figure four. So with your legs firmly placed on the earth, you take the right leg, if the right hip is bothering you, and I cross my ankle over my left knee, and my knee is placed at a close to 90 degree angle. So with this, my hip is in hip flexion, and external rotation. This is a fantastic stretch for the hip flexors, <clears throat> for the hip flexors, and also for just this whole outside hip area. If this is enough sensation for you, great. If you want a little bit more, you can slowly bend over, and you can even reach your hands down to grasp the anterior part of your shin. And this is a fantastic stretch, again, for the outer part of the hip, the low back. Um, for patients who have sciatica, this is a great, great stretch. You can repeat the stretch on the other side, just like this. Again, if you feel enough sensation here, stay there. You can lean forward if you wish, and then kind of the final manifestation of this posture is bringing this hand in between your legs and then wrapping your shin, promoting an even deeper stretch into your hip joint. This posture can also be performed reclining on your back and just drawing your legs up like this. This takes the gravity out of the picture. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> mm. 
have a passcode. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> so how do scientists measure the benefits of yoga? Uh, so that's a great question, because a lot of the effects of yoga are um, are kind of abstract. So scientists as outcomes will measure blood pressure, heart rate, because again, we know that yoga um, Im improves the parasympathetic nervous response. So that's one way to measure the physical manifestations, the physical benefits of yoga. A lot of the yoga research is actually done with patients with questionnaires. Um, so there are various questionnaires uh, surrounding insomnia. There's a sleepiness scale. Um, there's a fibromyalgia pain scale. Um, there's a depression scale that we use. And there's also um, just ge generic quality of life um, questionnaires. So much of the research in yoga um, is surrounded, um, surrounds these questionnaires, usually before and after. So the patients will um, perform the questionnaire before a yoga intervention and complete the questionnaire at the end. And that's how scientists um, affect the efficacy of the, of the intervention is um, it's the most objective way of, of of receiving that information. <clears throat> all right, I think those are all the questions that, that we have. <clears throat> um, I do wanna show you a couple of stretches that you can do as you're seated in your um, office space, if you have a desk job and you're seated like this all day long. Um, just a couple of ways to move, to bring some more energy to your body. Um, so spinal twist is a great stretch to help just kind of loosen up the spine. So with your feet planted on the floor, you can take one arm on the back of your, of your uh, backrest and then the other arm on the outside of your chair or if you have an armrest. And as you inhale, stretching the crown of your head to the ceiling, and as you exhale, just looking back behind your left shoulder. You can hold this stretch for a couple of breaths and then just repeat right arm on the back of the, of the chair and then taking your left arm, inhaling spine nice and tall and then exhale. I just heard a creak in my own back as well. So this is a great stretch to just kind of loosen up that spine um, loosen it up, get some more of the synovial fluid flowing as well too. And the neck, we carry a lot of tension in our neck and our shoulders as well. So just a gentle neck roll in circles like this can loosen up all of the little tight areas in our neck. And then a gentle stretch of just wrapping your arm around your ear and just bringing your ear to your shoulder, bringing the shoulder down. And this is a beautiful stretch that extends from your ears, down your neck, and to your shoulders as well. And then other side. And finally, we have a tendency to sit like this all day in our cars and in our chairs, shoulders hunched over. So a great stretch to open up the chest is clasping your arms behind your back. If you can't bind, another option is to grab a towel or a sweater like this and grasping your hands and then just opening up your chest, opening your heart to the ceiling. And this is a fantastic stretch just to open up the chest muscles, the shoulders. It's a great contrary to the this that we do all day long. All right. Are there any other questions on what's about it? Okay. So thank you for tuning in today. All right, you're off. We're off. That was great. <laughs> 12 on the dot. <laughs>